Welcome to another episode of Data Journeys. This is the place we come to learn from data leaders who have experienced amazing growth and have lots of learnings to share with us today. I'm excited to talk to Pedro from Farfetch. Farfetch is a company that went public just a few years ago, 2 million active users on their platform, $3 billion in revenue, 49% year over year growth. They have 30 data teams. That's 300 people that are working on data. So certainly we have a lot to learn from Pedro. Pedro, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Let's get started and tell us about Farfetch. What is the company? So Farfetch uh, is a, a company that aims to be the global platform for the luxury industry. Uh, we are more than 5,000 people all around the globe. And we are uh, most known by our marketplace of farfetch.com. So where we sell uh, products, luxury products from our uh, partners. So over the, the these last years, since we uh, um, launched the marketplace, we've been also looking at other business areas. We created a white label solution area for e-commerce, uh, which is Farfetch Platform Solutions. We acquired some companies like uh, Brown Stadium Goods, New Guards Group, and we partnership with some of the big players that we have within the luxury industry world. And so you have amazing growth. You started in 2008, went public in 2018. So you've had an amazing growth uh, throughout these years, and of course, a lot of data. So tell us a little bit about the volume of your data and the type of use cases that you're using okay. this data for. Yeah, that's that's right. Well, we use a lot, a lot of data. To have an idea on, on the numbers, uh, we have around five uh, petabytes of, uh, of data. We uh, have more than 1,000 uh, sources uh, that, that we use daily. Uh, we have, um, uh, more than uh, 700 uh, data users. For example, in BigQuery, we have uh, uh, more than 500 uh, active users every single day. This is uh, really, really interesting. And to give you uh, an idea, we have like 6 million queries every single month, uh, which as uh, uh, I understand, it's quite a lot. Yeah, it's really quite impressive. And you're using multiple parts of the stack using, of course, BigQuery, but you're also using Dataproc for your data lake, uh, Data Studio, Composer, uh, and you've done this for uh, over three years. Tell us a little bit about the use cases that you've developed, in, in particular, the omni-tracking uh, use case. Yeah, that's a, a really interesting one. As you were saying, we implemented uh, this stack uh, for almost four years now, uh, three and a half years. And uh, uh, we use all this technology that, that you mentioned. So uh, we decided to move to GCP and to all these other uh, Google uh, tech pieces because we were struggling uh, with the legacy uh, tech stack that we used. So uh, we started to move uh, and to use BigQuery uh, and, and GCP, not only as our query engine, but also uh, as the corporate data warehouse, let's call it that, that way. Uh, some people may discuss about the, if it is or not a data warehouse, but well, let's call it that way for now. One of the, the most recent uh, examples that we have is omni-tracking. So as you can imagine, we are a really big uh, marketplace. We have more than 2 million active uh, customers. Uh, so we need data. Uh, but uh, we gather a lot of data too. So we have all these tracking solutions. And uh, two years ago, we've decided to create uh, our own tracking solution uh, to, to capture uh, data both from the web and from our mobile, mobile apps. So it was a big project, as you can imagine, and we uh, delivered it uh, recently. And we are now using all these features and the product as the basis for uh, all the analysis that we do with that, with that data afterwards. Can you tell me more about this Omni tracking project? I mean, 2 million users, the data I'm sure is used across multiple business units inside your organization, marketing and finance. What specifically are you analyzing uh, with this data? Is this for offers? Is this for understanding the journey of, of uh, these uh, visitors? How is the data kind of being used? For now, we are really focused on product and we are looking to the customer journey too. So it's like uh, trying to understand not only uh, how the, the customers use our websites, our, our apps, but how can we use that data to create a different customer experience uh, to them. 
So that's one of the focus. We started to work uh, a lot with uh, one of our departments because they knew a lot about tracking. And it's really interesting that suddenly uh, we have several other departments that want to use also this new product. So they came to us with their requests and uh, with the features that they would like to use or even with new requirements. And from the point that we uh, deliver the, the, the project, we, we are already thinking of enriching the, the product itself because uh, it seems to be a, a good source uh, of data uh, to several uh, areas within the, the company. And this might lead to our best practice section here of this interview, but I'm curious about what, who were the first uh, you know, folks in the business department? Did you start with marketing? Did you start with finance? Where did you start? In this specific case, we started to work uh, with our product analytics team and with marketing. So these were the two areas that we started uh, with. And uh, what's the next department you're going after then now? We are now looking actually to use the solution um, across all, all the company uh, because as I mentioned, there are really, really a lot of uh, areas that want to, to use it. So uh, we are talking now about uh, finance, about commercial, for example, I would say that those would be the, the next areas to, uh, to use these this products. So through this migration, you've learned uh, a lot and you've accumulated technical best practices. What are kind of the two or three things that people need to think about as they're embarking on similar journeys? The first one is uh, you should have teams 100% focused and with a clear mission for them to achieve. So I believe that's really, really important. Of course, this depends uh, on the dimension of the project that you are talking about, but uh, it's more than proof that if you have teams focused uh, the results are, are quite better. We can also talk about creating mechanisms that help to unblock any situation that rises. Uh, and we don't want the teams to stop working, right? To stop their development and to stop publishing the, the products that, that we have. So think about it and create all these mechanisms. And I believe that's really, really uh, helpful. Uh, it's also, also really important to think on the approach for each of these projects that you have uh, concerning uh, how will you organize the teams. So I would say for a big project, maybe it makes sense, coming back to the first point, that you have uh, teams uh, fully dedicated in their specific area of knowledge. So maybe you have people focus on ETL, then you have people focus on the BI part and so on and so on and so on. In other projects, smaller ones, for example, maybe you can have one that is like full stack and they can work it uh, from the, the, the beginning till the, the delivery of the, the, the project. And I would say anticipate failure. Uh, and by that, uh, I mean, we know that things fail. The ETL may break, uh, data quality can be, uh, can be bad, things just go wrong. You can have a problem in your infrastructure, for example. We know this at some point in time will have, uh, happen. So think ahead and think how you can anticipate potential problems because in some cases you can do it. And I'm not just talking about creating these mechanisms around the data quality, for example. Uh, it's around creating some kinds of uh, alerts, comparing data. And this is interesting because here it is, use data to anticipate problems that you can have with your data platforms. Uh, I think that's really uh, something that we must assume. We'll have some problems, let's think how we can anticipate them in order to avoid mitigation measures uh, that we'll implement after um, uh, the problems rise. So use data on data. Yeah. Uh, anticipate People forget that to do ETL it. jobs. Yeah, anticipate that ETL jobs will fail. Anticipate that data quality is going to be bad and uh, any other issues like that. So you start that at the beginning of the project so you can build your alerts just the way you did it. Okay, those are great best practices. Now let's talk about the opposite, the, the things that you wish you had known when you started. We call them the worst practices. You know, <laughs> if you talk to yourself at the beginning of this project, what would you tell yourself? Don't do this thing because it's gonna get you in trouble. It's no different from other companies that I've worked before, to be honest. 
Uh, but uh, uh, one thing that is important is using, again, omni-tracking as an example. Uh, we are talking about a product that is to be used for the entire company. So you can start with requirements from a specific area, uh, but you should consider that when developing or thinking about the solution, that other areas will use it. So the solution should already consider this. So even that you don't go to the details of those requirements, you should have an holistic approach and to think that this will be used by, by everyone. Something that is really, really hard to manage is timings. So most of the times we rush to a, to a decision because we want to have that product or that project ready as soon as possible. And a lot of times this leads to bad solutions. So what I would say here is do the right thing in a timely manner, but do it right. So I believe that's, that's uh, really, really important. And then there are a lot of more technical uh, things that we should, uh, we should avoid, like cumulative metrics, uh, avoid joins, of course, and uh, avoid runtime logic. I know that most companies use these kind of uh, things as we do, uh, because again, you, you need to have answers and you need to have them quickly. So sometimes uh, it's not about the best solution, it's about having a solution uh, in a quick way. But I would say that these are the main uh, examples that I can give now. So those are great examples. Think wide and, and assume everybody's gonna be using the solution ultimately. Uh, so you could have a, a solution that can adapt in your case, starting with one department and quickly going to the rest of the, of the company. I am curious about, avoiding cumulative metrics. Can you tell us more about what that is? Or what is the issue there? The issue there is mainly uh, around past data. Uh, so uh, when you change anything, uh, if, you, if you need to, uh, to backfill the, the information, using cumulative metrics, this uh, turns the whole process much, much harder. So that's just one example. There are others if you need to reprocess something or something like that. But uh, yeah, that's what it is about. And would you say, I mean, using cumulative metrics is something we used to do in the past because we didn't have the options that we have today or what's the what's behind this guidance? Because I think when people, you know, move to the cloud and modernize their stack, there are concepts that existed in the past that were best practices in the past that are no longer best practices here. Is, it, is this one of those? I think we can we can consider that and is exactly as you are saying we are in a completely different moment than we were five ten years ago unfortunately we continue to use uh, the same mindset in, in lots of uh, i talk with a lot of, of colleagues uh, a lot of companies and they continue to work uh, that that way and nowadays we have so many solutions we have different paradigms that that we can that we can use and look and look to and that it makes sense to th to think things in, in a different uh, in a different manner so it's not in most of the cases it's not about the technology so usually uh, it's more around the solution the way that you uh, design the solution and the, all the processes uh, associated with it we talk a lot about that when we talk with customers and people in the industry that have been there for a long time they'll expect things from a new platform that was there before but we actually don't you know, we tend to forget the reasons for why these things were there before, like things like index. And you talked about joins here. It's a great example as well. What about runtime logic? Tell me more about what's going on there. What's, uh, why do you want people to avoid runtime logic? Or why do you think it's, a, it's, it's something to watch out for? Usually, uh, the, the thing is here is to avoid having this logic uh, in views or in the reporting layer. Uh, why? Because if you have this logic in the end of the let's call it uh, data cycle when it is about to 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 be consumed if you want to change anything for example in your data warehouse in your ods in your data lake whatever most of the times this will have impacts in the end of that life cycle and again the life cycle i'm talking just before the data is about to, to be consumed. And what I also uh, know that happens is that the people that do this by the end of this uh, data journey, they are not so um, 
so skilled uh, in in uh, in tech. So actually, they struggle a bit to 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 have these changes. And there's another one. Even if they have, for example, in Farfetch, actually people have this uh, this knowledge, but here uh, uh, a problem of communication rises, which is in our case, for example, we have more than thirty data teams across the organization, and they have teams within. So it's a lot, a lot of people, more than uh, three hundred and fifty people. So making sure that any change that we have. Uh, that can somehow create a breaking change in this uh, data flow. Uh, it's hard to to get the message to everyone. Uh, so the probability of one change, even if it was communicated, to uh, create a breaking change by by the end of this chain is quite high. And uh, so uh, uh, if you can anticipate all the the logic, is like sometimes it's, it's not possible, but whenever possible. Uh, I believe that's the best way to do it, even because you can, for example, in the reporting tools and all of that, take that out and actually you'll gain lots of performance there too. So yeah, so it's a matter of basically better performance um, for the people consuming the data. Are you using materialized views or what are you using? I would say the answer to that is we use it all, but yes, we also yeah. <laughs> use materialized views. It's yeah, it's really a big, big, big department. So we use well everything. <laughs> so let me ask it. So now that you've achieved such a level of maturity, where are you going to next? So uh, focusing on data, what uh, I wanted to to do is to create a global reference data platform. So I'm not saying the the best data platform in the world, but uh, one that people can uh, refer to. We want to. Um, enable and to foster the use of data within the company uh, and i want also to make sure that farfetch is recognized not only in the luxury industry and within tech but also for data so that's something that i would really like like to 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 achieve and uh, we have some challenges of course farfetch is growing a lot year over year uh, we must have a platform that is resilient that accommodates all this growth and uh, all the features that the growth implies and all the changes in the industry uh, uh, imply and in tech of course and we want to be able uh, to quickly adapt to anything new that rises uh, either from an organic perspective or uh, something that uh, happened outside and uh, we must adapt for some reason and uh, I would love to uh, have a, a platform that allows us to do that. Pedro, thank you so much for your time today. That was just amazing. We learned how you need to build teams that are focused on particular parts of the process. We learn how to build for failure from the beginning, build alerts so you can anticipate ETL jobs failing, use data on data to check on uh, data quality. And then of course, don't be narrow in your approach. Think about this idea that your product, just like in your case, is going to be used across many departments. So think about the multiple uh, user types and personas. Thank you again so much for spending the time with us today. I hope people are going to reach out to you to learn from you. In fact, if you want to learn more from companies just uh, like this one, click on the link down below. Until next time, I'm Bruno Ziza.